Welcome to Simple Java Game Library, which is made for beginners with Tokyo EdTech. That is me. Today I want to introduce you to something I've been working on. Um, I think it's finally in a state where I could share it with people and you might be able to actually use it for something useful. Um, I call it the Simple Java Game Library. So I'm going to talk to you about what this is. You can probably guess from the title. I'm going to show you how to download it. It's really easy. I'm going to show you a little sample game that I'm still working on, but it kind of demonstrates the power of this uh, particular simple Java game library. And I'll help you get started and show you some of the classes and things that you can use to make some games. So simple Java game library is, as the name indicates, it is a library for making simple 2D games in Java. I wrote it for my students. Um, you, it is basically really, I think, really aimed at beginners, something that they can understand even with just kind of basic uh, Java knowledge and Java, and Java coding knowledge. So to download it, you just go to my GitHub and it is winein1004 and I'll put a link down below. And you'll see, actually if you go to this page, you'll see uh, projects, simple Python game library, don't get the wrong one. You'll see simple Java game library and Turing machine emulator that of course could change depending on when you watch this video. So I'm going to go to simple Java game library and you'll see here where it says code. I'm going to click download zip and it will download. It's about 7.4 megabytes. Um, I think seven of those megabytes are actually just an audio file, but uh, yeah. Anyway, so I've downloaded it. You'll see simple Java game library and I'm going to double click that to open it I'm going to extract it now again I'm running Linux you know what you see will be compared different depending on if you're running what Mac or Windows uh, I've tested on Mac but I haven't tested it on Windows yet so Windows people let me know how it goes so but it's Java so it should work so I'm going to go into simple Java game library and the Java files here there's a few of them. There's SJGL, that's the actual main library. There's the sound class, sound sprite class. There is a label class, and there is a demo game as well. And there is a template. I'm gonna show you how to use those uh, here shortly. Let me show you this demo game. This will kind of give you an idea of what uh, this can do. And the idea here is to make this as simple as possible for beginners to you know start getting used to making simple games so this is the demo game and it is 112 lines long and basically it's just it's just the beginning of a side-scrolling shooter so i'm gonna go ahead and hit compile and i'm running genie now it automatically compiles all of the files in the directory for me i'm gonna go ahead and execute it and you should see oops, it's on the wrong screen let me bring that up okay so you can see I got a little background music, I got background image. Okay. And you see, this basically shows you everything that this can do. We got sounds, we've got sprites, we've got labels where we can print text, and yeah, that's it. We got a screen. Let me close that for you. That's a little loud. And so this is included in in the file right now. I'll probably rearrange things later. I just want to get this out. I was really excited to share this with the world. Um, so let me go ahead and open up the template. Uh, so you'll see template.java. So if I open that up, and basically it's got some comments here. So if you run this, you'll see it's basically one, two, three, four, five, six, well actually basically five lines of code. If I compile this, and I run it, it puts, basically it puts up a blank window. Okay, now that should be 1024 by 768. I think that's the default, uh, but you can control that completely. So you can see here we are able to set the background color using the built-in AWT colors. Um, so again, one of the things I wanted to do with this was to introduce my students to how Java works, uh, but avoid some of the complexity of you know, how game programming works with, you know, you know, asynchronous timers and things like that. I'll show you some of that in a little bit, probably. Um, so let's try, let's try green. Let's just see how that goes. So I'm going to compile it again, and I'm going to run it. And hopefully we will see a, now a green screen. 
very very exciting i'll put that back to black uh, okay so basically what happens is you create a new game object okay? and that game object has several methods and things that you can use uh, one of one of which of course is set background color now speaking of sprites which are 2d game objects we have background sprites which basically you know are shown in the background and don't interact they don't collide with anything they're just there for you know really background um, so in the previous example you saw you know you saw the background so to create a background sprite you need to create a sprite and give it a name so for example let's let's go ahead and do the background there so background image and it's a new sprite and I'm gonna put that at zero zero which is the top left part of the screen and let me just copy that because I forget what exactly what I called it now one of the things I did to make this easy for my students especially today's students who are not very good at file management was just make it work so that everything is in the same folder so as long as this is in the same folder it should work so you'll see you know background 1024768 JPEG and now if I compile that and run it, you won't see anything. Okay, it's missing. And the reason is that creating it's one step, but we actually have to add it to the, the game, let's say the game engine or whatever you wanna call it. So game.addBackground sprite. And then in this case, this sprite is called background image. Okay, so if I compile that and run it again, I should see my nice little background. And I forgot where I got this image from, but it's in the commit where I actually committed that to my uh, repo here. So you can see, we've got a nice little background. So far, so good. Um, yeah. Then we can now go ahead and create a sprite for like our game objects. So let's go ahead and create the player. Uh, is that what I wanted? Yeah. So player, and that's gonna be a new sprite. And in this case, what I did was I, I'm gonna put the sprite in on the left side of the screen, it's zero X. And the screen I think by default is 768, so 350, well, I'll say 360. Let's put it around 360 on the Y. And I think I called it, what did I call it? We'll see if I called it player.png. So, We'll run it and see what happens. Do you feel lucky? Okay. Okay. It did compile. It is running, and I forgot to add it to the game sprites. So notice I am adding background sprites, and I am adding regular like to the game game sprites. Um, again, these do not interact. They're just for there for the background. Um, it could be moving clouds. It could be anything moving in the background. The game will render them first, so. The active sprites will be printed in front. Um, the background sprites will be printed, or rendered, I should say, in the background. So let's go ahead and try that again. And I guess my, okay, and we don't see anything here because sprite name is not correct, player. All right, let's try that again. So you probably see this pattern. So you create the object and then you add it. Okay, then now you can see there is the player object. Okay. Um, so let's go ahead and move it. So for this game to work, and again, I was trying to keep this as simple as humanly possible for my students. So we basically set up our game here. We create the game object. We can you know, set the background color, add some background sprites, add our game sprites. You know, I'll talk about sounds in a minute, labels. And then we have a while true loop, which is basically our game is going to run. Okay, so that's where our game code is going to go. So I'm just going to go ahead and kind of scroll down through here without without doing everything, uh, you know, on live. This is just kind of an introduction. So you'll see here where it says deal with key presses. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and copy that, and I'll explain what that does here in a second. Um, so paste that in there. So you'll see here that 
currently there is a way of getting the current key that is pressed. So it's game.getKey. Again, trying to keep it as simple as possible. We have object.method, something that my students are, you know, at all levels can really understand. And then we have various key events. And these are just straight out of the standard Java key event class. So VK underscore up, VK underscore down. And what that does is it sets our DY and DX of our sprite. So I'm gonna go ahead and run that. Or compile it, I should say, I'm gonna run it. Now when I press the up arrow, my sprite goes up. And when I press it, it goes down. Okay, so, and again, this, this will run faster. It's running slowly because I'm doing a screen recording. I'm surprised it's this small though, that's the thing. Maybe my screen resolution is a lot bigger than I thought it was. Um, so, where are we at there? Okay, so you can see how we can get some keyboard input um, that's in there. Now, if I open up the sprite class, um, sprite class has quite a few things going on there. And eventually, once I get this fully set up, I will do a proper explanation, some proper, <laughs> some proper documentation. But uh, you know, the, the sprite has an x coordinate, a y coordinate. It's the top left, not the center. Um, it has a dx and dy, which is the speed that it moves uh, left and right and up and down. It also has a heading. Um, you are able to rotate the sprites, um, and you can actually have it rotate, you know, automatically, just just like it's moving. It's rotating it in place, or you can actually set the heading directly. Uh, we have a couple default sizes, and there, there's some stuff here to deal with, you know. Lots of stuff to deal with, you know, hitting the hitting borders. What are you doing? Hit the boundary. Do you bounce? Do you warp around? Do you stop? Um, you can change. Is it visible? There's you know, all kinds of all kinds of different things we can do. Uh, again, I'm not going to go through everything. This is just you know, kind of give you an idea of you know what the, each class does. And there's all kinds of stuff you can rotate. You can do all the kind of normal kind of cool stuff that you do. You can obviously do. Uh, collisions, if something is colliding, and kind of go from there. Uh, let's see here, a couple other classes in here uh, we want to take a look at. Um, sounds. So if you want to create a sound, it's sound and you can give it a name. Um, so let's go ahead and so BGM, so that's background music. And this is one of the limitations because I wanted to keep this easy to download and cross-platform and just very simple to deal with. Um, I had to. I only use the built-in Java classes, so you are limited to basically WAV files. So you can't do MP3s. You have to convert them. Um, again, it was a conscious decision to keep it simple. And also, I wanted the students, my students, to be able to actually look at the code and kind of see how it's working. And then another thing I did here to keep it simple is bgm.play if you want to play a sound. And what's what makes this work really well is each sound can only play once at a time, I should say. So if you know if you're playing it and it's already playing, it won't play. It will ignore that second play until it's done. So that's why the background music keeps playing because of the loop that it's in. Okay, so we've got some background music playing, and that will go, you know, that will keep playing for us in the background. Again, key here was keeping it simple as possible. Um, labels are pretty simple to use as well. So I might say here, you know, score label, and I will say score, you know, you start the game at zero, and we'll put that, well, it does like four, five, 12. And we'll put it down about 50 and see what happens there. And then also, don't forget, we need to add the label to the game. So the game like library takes care of you know, all the rendering and all that sort of stuff for you. Oops, label, oops, backspace. Sorry. Yeah, normally uh, my tutorials are, I wouldn't call this a tutorial, it's kind of an introduction. But uh, yeah, I just wanted to get this out. It's something I've been working on and I'm really happy with. So should see here the score is zero and we can you know set that to any x y uh, you know the game engine basically takes care of all of the rendering for you so again I wanted to keep this as simple as humanly possible 
for beginners. So, you know, add a background image, add a, add a sprite, add a sound, play it, add a label, you know, just, it's, you know, just, you know, I see all these game engines that are supposedly good for beginners. They are not good for real beginners. Um, they, they're just far too complex. Uh, wait, there's way too much presumed knowledge that uh, most students just don't have uh, at the early stages of their learning. And so that is why I created this. So let me just kind of go through, I'll show you a couple quick things in some of the code to kind of give you an idea. So the actual library itself, it isn't that long. Um, it's only a few hundred lines, like 370 lines, give or take. And there is some rudimentary support for mouse as well. Um, I got some of the basic code from this website here. I didn't know how to do a lot of these things. I've been working on this for about a month and uh, I finally got a few things working that were uh, kind of causing some problems. And But as a user, you don't really need to look at this, but it is here if you're curious how all of this stuff works. Um, that was one of the other things I really wanted to the students to be able to do is to look at this and say, oh, I can kind of see how that works. I mean, you see there's still some testing code in there. This this is very much a work in progress. But again, I think it's at a point where, you know, you can actually do some things with it. Uh, one of the things, um, yeah, I had a problem earlier with it, but I fixed that literally this morning, was it would just crash when you had too many sprites on the screen. So let me go ahead and add from 30 to 300 enemies, and I'll show you how that works. Now, it's going to be slow because I'm doing the screen recording, but on my desktop computer, it runs pretty smoothly. Okay. So I can shoot. So this is 300 different sprites going on the screen, which is pretty cool. And it's working, I think, pretty well. I don't have a particularly powerful laptop or anything. Let's see if we can get 3,000. Let's just see what happens. Uh, that might crash. We'll see. Um, And, okay, well, it's still making sprites, I think. Yeah, if you see this part down here, this this is when there's a, it's, the system's kind of overloaded. That's what I fixed today. Every time that happened, it used to crash. But now now all the sprites are created. So now I've got 3,000 sprites on this running at the same time. Well, 3,002 if you count the uh, player. And... So I think that's a pretty impressive tally uh, to get 3,000 sprites running on a you know five-year-old laptop. Uh, now it is Linux, so it does run a little bit faster. But uh, anyway, so that was that's kind of it. Um, you know, you can kind of take a look at the demo code. You can see here how collisions work. Um, you know, there, there's quite a lot going on here, but it's not super challenging. There's some. Uh, code here for mouse clicks to test that, uh, but there's no mouse clicking in this game. But it's pretty simple. Um, it's pretty straightforward. You know, create your game object. Um, you can change the, the frames per second. Set your background color. You want to do a background sprite? Create some sprites. You know, I have a missile in the game, obviously. Uh, you know, create some random enemies. And uh, ex there's an explosion sound. There's a background music sound, as you saw earlier. And there's a label. So, yeah, and then so like, you know, things like, you know, if the missile, if the missile collides with a sprite, um, so in this particular game, if that sprite is, uh, you know, it's going to be an enemy, it can't collide with itself, it doesn't register, um, so you'll see explosion.play, so it'll play that explosion sound, and then we can remove sprites from the game, that was part of what I got fixed this morning, and, uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, I hope, uh, I know it was a little quick and wasn't really a, a tutorial per se, but hopefully that's enough to get you started playing with it um, if you're interested. If you have any questions, you know, drop me a message down below. Uh, you know, I'm, like I said, I'm really happy with this. I'm going to actually, I started actually using it with my students a couple weeks ago, an early version, but now it's really to a point where I can actually do some interesting stuff with it. Uh, but I just wanted to get them exposed to it and just so they have the basic idea how these things work. So anyway, uh, that is that. I think I covered everything. Um, yeah, so the main class is SJGL, um, Sprite, Sound, and Label. 
So I think with this engine, you can make basically, you know, a lot of classic 2D games. You do a platformer. There's there's a gravity thing that's built in, and you know, it needs some work, but uh, there's quite a lot that you can do with it. So thanks for watching. I know it was quick. But I just want to get this out there. Like I said, I'm really excited. A little bit proud of this, to be honest. Uh, I think it's it's going to really change, I think, the way I approach teaching Java to some of my students. And you know, the students that have done some Java, they can apply what they learn. Students that are learning Java, it'll give them something kind of cool and visual to do rather than just a bunch of boring old text. Anyway, thanks for watching. Keep on coding.